Welcome to The Cop and the Shrink, a podcast exploring mental health, law enforcement, and societal issues from the perspective of a police officer and a mental health professional. Have questions about current events, social media, mental health, or police matter? Visit thecopandtheshrink.com. Let's get this episode started with your hosts, Harold Bozeman and Dennis Carradine. All right, welcome, folks, to another installment of The Cop and the Shrink. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. How doing are you? Well. Very good. We, had, You know, last time was a really good interview with uh, Officer uh, Officer Giles there. That was really good. So we got to top that this week, right? I don't think there's any way you top Tyler Giles. Nah, that, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. But we're going to try. So uh, thanks for listening to The Cop in the Shrink. Go to thecopintheshrink.com or check us out on the interwebs. And again, I say interwebs because if you know the reference... If you know the reference of the interwebs, it's a hysterical video when years ago, it was a guy doing, what was it? It was the, the chicken and detail or whatever it was. It, it was a, a basketball. No, it wasn't basketball Jones. I forget the barbecue Jones, barbecue and, and like detail <laughs> service and lawyer service, whatever. So go to the cop of the shrink.com. Uh, go check us out on Facebook, Instagram, on Twitter. And also, you know, we do have, <laughs> if you can't see, we have tons of product placement. If you're watching on YouTube, on the YouTubes, if you're watching on YouTube, we have product placement all over today. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but we have some good topics. We, I, I think today might, we might break some <laughs> ceiling. We might even break a window today let me break a window we've got a couple of things to talk about that are pretty pretty pertinent to the to the present time so to present time things that are going on now so i you know one of the big things that we have to kind of look at and we've we've talked about this in in a couple of our other sessions and so forth about um just dealing with general violence and so forth and what what what's really going on uh, in the world right now. And there's a theory that came out that I, I wanted to talk about, and, and I know that, that you know this theory exceptionally well. It's called the broken window theory. Can you give a definition of the broken window theory? Right, so the broken windows theory was something that was written about in an article in the Atlantic magazine, like in the early 1980s, I want to say 1984. Uh, a couple sociologists wrote about this this theory of about crime why crime happens how crime can be deterred i um, mean the broken windows theory put simply was that it, if if a neighborhood is in blight and and someone comes along and sees a house that's not being taken care of it's it's poorly cared for it's in shambles there's already a window broken the lights don't work the likelihood that somebody's going to throw a rock and break another window because nobody cares about that house is pretty high um, so they, they equated broken windows, literal broken windows in, in homes and buildings to, to the crime rates and to the growth of crime at the time in the 1980s. Um, as you know, Manhattan in the 1980s was almost unlivable. Oh, God. Prostitution, drugs, homicides. Uh, Times Square was a cesspool. Right. Uh, and these, these two men wrote about broken windows. Um, and then when Bill Bratton took over as commissioner under Rudy Giuliani the first time, in New York City, his first stint as commissioner, he really bought into the broken windows theory. He really thought, hey, these guys have something here. Maybe we can apply this to crime on the macro scale in New York City. And what he did was he started, I don't want to say aggressively, but prolifically enforcing um, smaller, what people consider minor quality of life, property crimes, things like that. Um, so somebody busting your car window, somebody... Maybe stealing your your purse, you know, if it's sitting next to you, smaller, smaller crimes that may or may not be highly punishable. Right. So one of the things the commissioner noticed was that the crime rates in the subways was exceptionally high, and all of the subway trains, like almost universally, the subway trains were covered with graffiti from different gangs, from different taggers. Um, so he he focused initially on the subway, and then expanded the broken windows from there. So what they started doing is he made it a systemic approach. He got it. He got it so that he was working with transit authority. He was working with public works. He was working with parks and recs. He was working with all these different departments to address crime. And so it, it got to the point where they 
rotated all the trains and all the buses out of service, cleaned them up, repainted them if they needed to be painted, and only put clean transit vehicles back in right. service. And then whenever graffiti showed up, they wouldn't leave it. They wouldn't leave it as somebody's bragging point. They would take it out of service, they would clean it off again, and then put it back in service clean. Um, so on top of addressing the things like vandalism and graffiti that were a visual blight, they also started enforcing the smaller quality of life crimes. And what he found was the commissioner put foot cops in the subways with the simple task of watching for turnstile jumpers, right? So they had him down there, it, what's this, 1988, 89. They're looking for somebody committing a 25 cent crime, a 50 cent crime. So, but you have to define what a turnstile jumper is. That, you know, that, in the psychology world, it might right, sound so differently. All right, just as a piece of a piece of New York history. This is his, but it's still it, it's still pertinent it's today. It's still pertinent today. It's still pertinent today. Um, so you have to pay to get into the subway. Like uh, it's not like a bus. When you get on the bus, you pay. When you get on right. the bus in the subway, you have to pay or swipe your metro card to get even through a turnstile or through a gate to get you where the trains are stopping. Right. So you have to pay to get access to the to tunnels the to get yeah. on the trains. Um, and some people don't want to pay. Right. So some people, if, if nobody's looking, if there's no transit cops around, they'll just jump That's over the turnstiles. Turn so okay. rather than pay and have it turn and go through, they'll jump we're, the turnstiles. We're not talking about anybody, you know, jumping in that sense. We're, right. We don't have to talk anybody down from a turnstile. Right. I'm just, I'm just throwing my two cents. Three feet high. Three feet high. <laughs> so... <clears throat> It's, at the time, it's a 50-cent crime. It's a 25-cent crime or whatever. But what the commissioner and, and his commanders found out was that if you, he put the cops on foot in the subways, some in plain clothes, some in uniform, but specifically watching for these things, turnstile jumpers, mm -hmm. um, like property thefts, purses off of the benches, pickpockets, things like that. They're looking for these minor crimes. And what they found was that they, that was leading to the detection of more serious crimes. Right? He was finding people with loads of drugs in their pants or carrying guns or wanted for violent mm -hmm. felonies mm -hmm. or for other violent crimes. So the, the act of addressing these, the, these metaphorical broken windows was that they were also addressing the larger issues in crime. Right, right. right? So then it, it came out of the subways and they started addressing the blight in the neighborhoods. And like I said, they had the housing authority and others on board with this program. So they started fixing up the homes, they started fixing up the apartments, they started cleaning up the streets. Uh, and, and from 1988 to, you know, 1998, from in, during that time period, Manhattan went from being the cesspool to being the safest large city in the world. Right, you, right. I, at, the, at the time, um, in, the, in the early 2000s, I felt more comfortable walking through Manhattan at 3 a.m. than I did through some cities at 3 p.m. Very true, very um, true. And so a lot of people take the broken windows theory and they look at it as a negative thing. They look at it like it, you know, it gives gives police the license to harass people or or people get picked on for things that are that are minor and inconsequential to the rest of the world. But the the idea is to address the to address the blight in the neighborhoods, to to address the blight in the neighborhoods and fix up the properties and to fix up the streets. It gives an impression that someone's there who cares. Right. And the vast majority of the people who live in these neighborhoods do care. Right. We find, you know, north of 90 percent of the people that live in these neighborhoods where the crime is prevalent really don't have anything to do with the crime. They live there and they care about right, the neighborhood. Right. And and like five percent of the population is committing most of the crime. Right. So they clean up the neighborhoods. They give the appearance. They give the impression that the neighborhood is well lived in, well loved and well cared for in hopes that the crime will go somewhere else. And for the few stragglers that stay behind and decide they're going to continue to do crime there. Then the broken windows practitioners go after them for, for minor things, craps right. games on the street, loitering, drinking, open containers, you know, turnstile jumping things. And, and that leads to the detection of bigger things. It, it always has. So it, it doesn't have anything to do with harassment, right? The police were stopping people who were committing offenses, committing right. violations of the law. No matter how small the violation that started that encounter was, if you find a gun that this person was on their way to shoot someone with, isn't it okay that we stopped him for loitering or playing a craps game? Sure, sure. Well, it's, it's typically, you know, these smaller events lead to much broader issues, right? You know, so when you start doing those smaller events, I guess the psychology behind it is is that people, people in general, you know, our general public are looking at the police officer saying, well, why are you, you know, messing with that guy? He didn't do anything. And and you hear that often, where you know you're in a you're in a crowded situation, um, and the officers 
you know, going going for a guy with whatever type of small minor issue, and the crowd jumps on that officer at the time. So, you know, leave him alone. He's not doing anything wrong. But if you go back and you look at this guy's crime report, it, it's pretty extensive. And and if you do find a gun on the guy, maybe he's a person that's uh, prohibited for for having a, a weapon. You know, it's it's a good game. But the idea is, is the public mm-hmm. perception of it isn't what. I think it needs to be. I mean, would that be accurate to say? I, I think there's a, a problem with perception. And like I said, I think people perceive that when when a when an agency or when a chief or when a unit announces that they're engaged in what could be classified as broken windows policing, I think that I think the misperception is they're they're going out there and quote harassing everything that moves, and that's really not the case. Yeah. Like the, the the reality of it is, we're looking for violations of the law. And when we find violations, of law, even the minor ones, we're going to stop and talk to people about them. And uh, honestly, in in a great number of those cases, even if we find a minor violation, even if someone's loitering or drinking, um, they've been they've been turned away. Like right, if, right. if nothing larger than that is going on, right? Good, you know, pour your beer out, throw it away, and get off Keep the corner. Walking, stop yeah. playing craps in front of these kids. You know, right. you can't hang out here in front of the store. You're blocking the entrance. Things like that. They're they're told to go away. The encounters that go bad are the ones where a guy who stopped for loitering knows that he's caught with a right. pocket full of drugs or with a gun in his waistband. That's Those are the encounters that go bad. Those are the encounters that always end up on someone's camera phone and uploaded sure. to YouTube, right? <laughs> um, the ones where we stop and, and tell somebody, you don't do that again, you know, you got to go away. Right, those right. those things, they don't make the news. They right. don't. Uh, but that's the vast majority of these encounters. Do you also think, <clears throat> excuse me, do you also think that people that know that they've done something wrong, try to exploit the situation in that in that broken window sense. They exploit the situation so that the officer may back off from them. I mean, and, and I'm trying to think maybe, maybe that doesn't sound as clear as it needs to be. But I'm thinking, you know how you have the person that automatically pulls up their phone, puts it into the officer's face, at start saying, I want your badge number and your name, and I need to speak to a supervisor, or, you know, I know my rights, and and so forth. And they might have been pulled over for, let's say, a, a window tinting violation, you know, where here in Delaware, you can be pulled over for a window tint violation, having dark, dark windows. Mm-hmm. But yet, you're, you're pulling this person over, they may know that they've done other things, but they're trying to turn the table on the police officer. And I think you're right there. I think that that's, that's an effort. I, I, I don't want to say intimidate, but maybe discourage. Like, I think that Demanding a supervisor, pointing a bunch of cameras at, at an encounter that the police are involved in. I think that's an effort to discourage the police from doing whatever right. they're doing, right? They they want they want the police to second guess themselves. Well, well, you know, am I doing the right thing? Should maybe they're right, I shouldn't have stopped them for this. I'm I'm gonna have all this scrutiny. But you know what? Now the tables are turned. Right. Right. Now in Delaware, our cops are wearing cameras to every one of these encounters. Right. So now there's not the opportunity for for creative editing. There's not the opportunity to cut off the first two minutes of an encounter and put the worst parts of it on YouTube because we have a counter to that, right? We we turn on our cameras as we approach someone. So we have the entire encounter recorded. Uh, And and so I think that for the past several years, everyone has been demanding. We want the cops to wear cameras. We want accountability. We want body cameras on every cop. The tides are starting to change now. They're... They're starting to find out that these cameras, and it's a great tool. It's, right now, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have, finally, all the police in Delaware wearing cameras um, because it's a great tool in that now now people that were previously maybe creatively editing or not telling the whole story are being confronted with the actual truth, and the actual truth kind of disproves their narrative in a lot of cases. It, and if it does disprove the narrative, which I which I like that, I, I, I like that phrasing, disproving the narrative, because what ultimately becomes the narrative is that we're, we're doing something wrong. You know, whatever minor violation it is, we're doing something wrong, but we're trying to say that we're not doing it wrong. You know, and I, I looked at the broken windows theory of not only, you know, people starting to believe that police are harassing somebody for it, but you're still doing something wrong regardless of what it is if you have a group of kids that go and 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 i like your 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 statement you know you have a group of kids that are turnstile jumpers you know they jump over the turnstiles they 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 go in without paying that quarter or 50 cents or whatever it is they're still doing something wrong they're doing something illegal right 
And, and 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 so where do we as society and i guess this is more of that psychological point where do we as society say well that's okay to do that's these minor little crimes are okay to do it, it, well you know it's kids being kids he didn't mean it you know oh you know you well you, you know he he busted the window cuz he was angry well no you're right and you i know. think that i th- the perception has been in the past that Anybody engaging in any agency, any unit, any team engaging in broken windows style policing or broken windows style enforcement, which just going out and like wholesale scooping people up, right. like indiscriminately just going out and wholesale scooping up groups of guys, groups of girls in the streets for no reason. And it, that couldn't be further from the truth. The truth is that it was always about enforcement of the smaller crimes right. in hopes of either deterring or detecting the larger crimes. Right. If if guys are if guys have a propensity to deal drugs on this particular corner or there's right. a lot of violence on this particular corner and now we have an officer that's been assigned to that neighborhood for years has never moved his purpose there is to get to know the residents his purpose there is to get to know the criminals and right. the problems and the bad spots uh, and and they're assigned there so now they're out there enforcing the smaller laws right right they're detecting these larger crimes right so it's never been about just wholesale, indiscriminate. Like they talked about the gun squad in New York City. Oh, they're just stopping people, just stop and frisk. And there were always rules about stop and frisk. And there were always rules about broken windows. Well, it, it, and again, I guess it's the moral dilemma of it all. Uh, my thought is, is, you know, minor crime. What's a, you know, whatever your definition of minor crime is. If you're out, there's a, <laughs> there's a, uh, a, an intersection here in, because we're here in the state of Delaware. There's an intersection in the state of Delaware. No lights, no nothing. Barely traveled at, at 12, 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, they call it the valley area and whatever. And, and right near this, the state park area, there's a stop sign. It's a four-way intersection. It's a stop sign. No one. You drive there at one o'clock in the morning. I've I've done it multiple, multiple times. You drive at one o'clock in the morning and you come to this stop sign. There's no police around. There's no vehicles around. There might be the angry Canada goose hanging out on the corner just staring at you. That's it. What do you do? Do you stop? Do you come to a complete stop, which is the law to come to a complete stop of that stop sign? Or do you kind of roll through it? Was it the California stop or whatever they call it? You roll through it. Or do you just, you know, have reckless abandon and just drive right through it? Because, you know, the police aren't around at that time. And you're the only person in the forest, right? it, it, Literally, there is no one else around with it. And I think that becomes the moral issue. Now, I would say that the majority of people are good. The majority of people are, are morally bound to some sort of ethical response to something. And they're going to stop because that's the rule and that's how our society goes. Majority. Now, what's the majority? 51% could be the majority, right? So there are other people that would not view that if there's nobody around, nobody's coming, nobody's in any direction, there's no police around to enforce this law, eh, you know, I'm going to drive through it. And, and to me, that comes to that broken windows theory. That's one of those minor crimes that we, we tend to let slide, and then people get offended if they get, if they get busted about right. it. And, and it just goes back to the larger picture, too. We, now we have, there, there are activists and there are politicians who are saying, well, maybe, maybe the police shouldn't just be stopping people on the highway for registration violations or stopping people on the highway for, for equipment, like, like brake lights are out or window tint, like right. you said, or, or you know, minor speed violations five or six miles over right maybe maybe the police shouldn't stop those people well a lot of the times the cars that are being used to transport drugs or to carry out violence are either stolen or they're you know they're not registered the paperwork's not right and we don't we don't detect those crimes being moved from one place to the other unless we are enforcing the traffic laws right there if if the politicians don't want us enforcing the traffic laws, they have to take the laws off the books. Right. But as it stands now, there's still the laws there, and people should still abide by the laws. And if they don't, they deserve to be stopped. And I'm not saying everybody gets a ticket for everything they're stopped for. I've I've maintained, and this is just me, right? I don't speak for an agency or a profession, but for me, I, I was in traffic enforcement for several years, and my position was just because I've pulled you over doesn't mean I've decided you're being ticketed, right? No, that no. is ultimately up to you. Right. 
your your demeanor, um, you know, your explanation. You have a good explanation. Right. I was right. Right. I was speeding because I'm having a, a medical emergency. I was speeding because I I'm having a bathroom emergency. I really need to get home. These are valid things, right? I don't. Right. I don't. Just because I had pulled somebody over, I hadn't decided yet whether they were going to get a ticket. I wanted to look into their explanations, their reasons, their right. their individual situation. Right. I didn't have this blanket. And some and some officers do, and I don't I don't fault them either. Some officers have a philosophy that if I had the reason to pull you over, I had the reason to ticket you, and they do it a different way. It's just different. Right. We have discretion in these cases, so it's a different way of doing things. But that, like we talked about a couple episodes ago, there are, there are people, there are um, activists, and there are certain segments of society now who have decided that the law, at least the law as pertains to some minor offenses, has been canceled. Right? They can get away with loitering. They can get away with drinking on the street, shoplifting in some yeah, cases. Yeah. Retail theft up to nine hundred dollars in some jurisdictions. <laughs> we talked about that. Um, that the, the law has been canceled, and that, and they're starting to find out now. These areas. Let's take Portland for example. Portland won't hire more police. Portland won't enforce the laws that are on the books. Portland took uh, an entire summer to evict people from from laying siege to a federal courthouse and right. to a police station. Um, and and the problems that they're having now that the law has been canceled in Portland are astronomical. And, and, and- when we talk about canceling the law, it, it, it hasn't been canceled. It's just that perception it's of it. It's been constructively you know? canceled, right? Yeah. Because they don't want any the, – the, the politicians and the powers that be don't want the laws enforced. Right. So the police back off because they've been, if not told to, at least been implied that they should. Right. Uh, and then and then the crime rates rise. Now we have violence in Portland at, at – um, you know, I know you hate it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think the violence in and of itself, and, and we're going to talk about violence in, in the, the the current events topic uh, or section of the uh, of the thing. But again, I think we have to kind of look at what's really the bottom basic issue here, and it's it's we've kind of turned into a society that wants to pick and choose the laws, yeah. and and we want to pick and choose the laws that benefit us. And then ultimately hold that police officer responsible. Now that's not the police officer's fault. That's that society's fault. You know, if I get, if I'm speeding and I get pulled over and I pull that, hey, I, I know Harold Bozeman card. I mean, one of two things going to happen. I might get shot right on the spot, depending on who pulls me over. You know, one well, no, of those guys are all retired. All <laughs> <laughs> or you know, they oh 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 it's Doc. Oh okay, we'll you know we'll let you go. But I'm still in. The wrong. I am still breaking the law. You know, now I have a confession to make. I, I do, and I haven't told you this, and we've been friends for a long time now. When I was three, I stole penny candy from from Woolworths. That's how long ago it was, right? You're a shoplifter. And then <laughs> I went outside. I was three. I put it in my little, little uh, pants, and then I walked outside, and I pulled it out and showed my mother. You know, my mother picks me up by my arm, walks me back in, tells me to hand the candy over and made me apologize to the to the counter person and all that stuff. Guess what I have never done since? Got caught. Got caught. <laughs> <laughs> I have never stolen anything because that in and of itself is the, the basic rule of crime and punishment, right? I'm never going to do that. Why? Because I was put into a position where I was humiliated, right? I was put in a position that ultimately my offense was was something that, that was so egregious. My mother brought me in and made that thing. So my thought is is that you're thumbing the nose at police because they're they're upholding the law when you know that you're doing something wrong. So so here's the thing with that. People want to point the finger at the police for enforcing the laws, right? He sh- she shouldn't be enforcing the loitering laws. He shouldn't be arresting someone for playing craps on the street. It's not hurting anybody. It's victimless, right? So the cops shouldn't be enforcing these crimes. But we already discussed how that leads to the detection of bigger things. Right. If if the activists and the politicians don't like that, the police aren't the appropriate target. Yeah. The appropriate target is to go to your legislature and say, I don't like that the police enforce these laws. These are victimless. So let's start lobbying to take these off the books. The police swore to uphold the law in whatever their jurisdiction is. They, right. they swore to uphold the law. They swore to enforce the laws that the legislators put on the books. Right. If the legislators and the politicians and the activists don't like the laws that are on the books, then you start lobbying to change that. Right. Because I'm not going to change my oath. Right. I'm not going to change the promises I made and what I swore to do. So if you want me to change what I enforce, 
take them off the books and I won't need to. <laughs> Not only take them off the books, but then change your entire moral outlook of the world. Again, I, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with taking laws off the books just because people don't want to get caught. I agree with the, the fact that if we have any moral conundrum, we have to go on to the side of an ethical response. That's just, that's, that's my thing. I'm sorry. If I go lobby somebody and say, well, we should never get busted for speeding or, you know, that unwritten law of over eight miles an hour, mm -hmm. we should, you know, you shouldn't pull anybody over unless they're doing 25 miles uh, an hour over. I, it, come on. At, at some level, and I'm not yelling at you. I'm just saying, come on. At some level that these crimes are these crimes and, and they need to be stopped and then we're holding police to the standard that they're the bad guy for enforcing the law and they're not. And you can find videos all over the internet of, of ridiculous laws that exist that are still in the books for, you know, a hundred years, things that don't make any sense today. Fishing on horseback. Right. If, if, <laughs> if you're in a jurisdiction where fishing in a creek off of a horse is illegal and you get caught doing it, you, you've broken the law. You, do you, do you do you whine and complain about it? Or you just pay the fine, and then you don't fish on horseback anymore. You take it like an eighteen-year-old man. And there are some laws. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you now, there are some laws that are on the books that that could be damaging. There are laws that target specific groups of people. There are right. laws that you know were are based in bias and racism that should be taken off the books if and where they still exist. Absolutely. But look, lo loitering, uh, loitering is colorblind. Craps games are illegal. You can't drink on the street. Like. Speeding is colorblind. I mean, right. you know. I mean, you talked about the dark window tint. If it's three in the morning and I have an officer in a, in a police car, fifty feet behind a car that's that's heavily tinted and the area is poorly lit, do I do I know who's driving the car? No, I just no. know the car is heavily tinted. Just pull them over for that. It leads to bigger things. What have you? It, it's if they don't like that law, I'll remove it from the books. Then the cops will stop enforcing it. But I I think. The broken windows theory, if it's properly applied, let's get back to the. Let's bring. Yeah, this, let's bring it back. Let's Sorry, bring we, we're circle. going off. Yeah, let's bring this full circle. The the theory or the the idea of broken windows, if it's practiced appropriately, if it's practiced in a in an objective way, and in a way that targets laws, not people, right, and problems, not people, I, I think it's it's very effective. It's been shown to be very right. effective. It, it the huge turnaround of New York City in, in the period of a decade proves. In a, you know, in a city that size, it can turn around in, in one decade. It proves it's highly effective. And I think that we still have, they, they don't call it this anymore because of the stigma, but we still have chiefs and sheriffs and, you know, and commanders that are exercising or practicing broken windows under other names, right? Right, right. Community policing, district integrity, things like that. Leaving officers assigned to a geographical area so they get to know the people, places, and things. Yeah. I think broken windows still exists in practice even if not as much anymore in name i think the name has become the thing that was stigmatized yeah well we could we could go back just watch the warriors what was that circa 1972 i think yeah, it was 72 watch the warriors that gives you that gritty gritty 74 73 74 thank you watch Mr. the warriors because that that'll show you the the nature of the nature of uh of new york at that time was an absolute 79 wow. oh my god okay so it was a cesspool in 79 yeah but if you watch it i mean it just gives you you know kind of that that reference point and then you go to ed Koch's. It shows uh, you how difficult it was to get across brooklyn in 1979 especially dressed up as an indian chief i mean that was kind of weird <laughs> or if you were the what were they the uh the baseball guys you know that was kind of wild anyway <laughs> so we're going off on it but good talk i you know honest to god i think it's it's, it's again it's something that can be brought out more maybe we bring this back at some point maybe we talk to some old school and new school cops that have done it i don't know but you know again if you if you have any questions about it and anything that we could help you with either the the policing behind it the psychology behind it please uh, send us an email you could send it directly to me at dennis at the cop in the shrink .com or go to our website at the cop of the shrink uh, .com and check us out on facebook uh, at uh, facebook.com slash the cop in the shrink or the interwebs or instagram still haven't made the only fans yet we're still still waiting for approval Maybe we should hold off on that yeah, we'll see what happens with it but good talk good talk we'll be back for our uh, next section here Great topic for number two. Thanks. The Division of Wellness Services of the National Fraternal Order of Police is committed to leading the efforts to ensure the well-being of law enforcement officers. 
the FOP intends to no longer react to issues of critical stress affecting its members, but instead take a pre-act approach that is driven by trained peer support, research, empowerment of officers, awareness, and stigma reduction, connections to service, and ongoing training and development. Information about the Wellness Division, resources, and publications can be found at fop.net front slash officer wellness. Donations to the National FOP in support of their Division of Wellness Services and other programs can be made online at nfop.firstresponderprocessing.com. And we're back to the cop and the shrink. Remember, visit us at thecopandtheshrink.com. We do have product placement all over the place. We'll go over it real quick. We got our uh, Wagon House Winery, the Captain's Punch, named after Captain Alan Davis, retired uh, Chester police officer. Go to wagonhousewinery.com. You can pick it up. Proceeds go to the Hospital Heroes Program as well as our uh, Law Enforcement Scholarship Fund. Uh, check out uh, the uh, Survivor's IPA here from Big Oyster brewery this will be a featured beer at the delaware beer fest go to delawarebeerfest.com tickets are very limited we're selling like mad and our lifeblood which is amazing this is actually our cowboys blend of the survivors beverage company coffee uh you can go to drinksurvivors.com pick up uh, a little bit of caffeine uh, uh their k cups it's actually what it's pumpkin spice error i had to give the wife a uh, fall budget for decorations <laughs> this year and and i said well you know i gave her gave her a number and she literally skipped out of the house she she was wearing uggs and a and a really long scarf even though that it was 87 degrees well, you and have to dress for the occasion then she got the pumpkin spice latte and was was good to go <laughs> so now my house is blessed with fall and that, that's okay that's okay we still got two more days right 22nd becomes fall i think yeah whatever it is yep so, so topic number two today in the, in the show, this is one that we, we laugh about. If, if you're old people like us, uh, you'll remember Mac Davis, and he sang a song, It's So Hard to Be Humble, and the, when it's so hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way, right? So second topic we wanted to talk about today is the God complex. Now, God complex in the theory, and I'll start with this theory in, it, in and of itself, isn't just for policing it it clear and and i clearly not because narcissism amongst <laughs> clinicians is rampant narcissism among psychologists therapists is is ridiculous at this point right so wanted to talk about what the god complex is why it starts up and why both situations or why both fields actually actually have it pretty bad and then how can we break that that fourth wall how can we break it to get the ability for a therapist to help a police officer and a police officer to open up to a therapist that might think that they are this God, you know, right, because you get to the point where, you, you know, you get a police officer that, that that's sitting in an office saying, I don't need help. And if I did, you can't help me. Yeah. Right? So we have that. <laughs> then, the, then the God theory, the God complex. And then, the, then, the, then the, obviously the clinician, clinician goes, is saying, well, I can help anybody. I am, I am the expert here. So the God complex, if we look at it, and, and it is what it is, it's really, it's basic, based on arrogance and narcissism, saying that a clinician or an officer or, or a certain field, surgeons have it as well, where you feel because of your training, your background, the knowledge of the world around you, that you are not necessarily better than people but you're overseeing everyone you're above everyone else and being above everyone else means is that you are deciding the fate of other people you're in the clinician world you're diagnosing people you are prescribing some sort of treatment and that treatment is based on them not getting better but getting well that ultimately you are quote unquote saving their lives you know, and I, and and I've gone back to it several, several times. It's it it literally makes us look like some of the biggest pompous people in the entire planet because we look like we're constantly judging, which we are. I mean, let's let's be honest about that. We talked about that in a different section. Is that one of our personality traits? Is that a the minute we meet you, we've already diagnosed you, and and two. You know, we're judging people from afar to kind of see their behavior traits, their cognition, and, and so forth. And that's based on training. The problem is, is that I think the God complex comes into play when people don't know how to turn that off. Right. And, and that's when it, when it spills over into your social life, right? I think I talked in our first show about 
you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Right? I, I, we've decided on our way to meet you before yeah. we've shaken your hand. We've decided: do we trust you? Right. Um, are we suspicious of you? Do we do we like you? Or will, will we or will we not be friends? We've we've probably already decided before your last name comes out of your mouth. Right. Um, and, and that's not necessarily a good thing. That just comes from a lifetime of assessing situations on the fly, like assessing situations at, at the snap of a finger so we know right. who's safe and who's not safe, who we want to be around and who we don't. Um, so for you, it comes down to y you have this need to save or to fix people. You know, right. fix people, fix, right? Quote, unquote, fix. And, and then for, for law enforcement first responders, we have a need to ensure our own safety right and so we're we're judgmental of you we, we've decided whether or not we trust you right off the bat right and that's it's kind of a safety mechanism see and we could even go it a little bit deeper within the clinician i think in the world of mental health if you break it down the sociology and psychology the the social worker sociologist uh wants to save they want to be that that saving grace of everybody take everybody in you know that we we would joke around in my in my one of 400 uh, 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 internships that are all unpaid you know that, that that the social worker would walk in to a uh, a child's unit and wanted to take all the children home and then the psychology major the psychologist would walk into the children's unit and want to diagnose all of them and figure them out Right, so it's it, there's a nuanced difference, but there is a difference between the social worker saving and the psychologist fixing. Fixing, right? You know. I want to save them. That's for them. Right. I want to fix you because I want to prove I could do I it. I could do it. Right. So right. I want to prove that I'm better than you. You know that I I can fix you because I am superior, and that becomes the God complex. Now I'm not saying that about me per se but <laughs> but when you walk into a situation and i think it you know for us what's the worst thing or or the last thing that i tell people what i do and, and you think about it, we've talked to before the last thing that i tell somebody is that i'm a, I'm a trauma therapist or that you know i'm a therapist in general that's the last thing i tell people people walk oh hey what do you do for a living oh i you know i i'm a, I'm a father uh former you know volunteer firefighter you know da da da, da. and by the way i'm a shrink <laughs> and it, and the immediate questions start coming out of you know it, and there's those funny ones where they come out and say oh you know i have a friend and then you have to figure out oh is the friend you brad you I'm know asking for a friend asking for a friend or or oh you know don't shrink my head and my my funny response has always been ah don't worry about it you're not that you're you're not that interesting you know and it, and to me it's a funny response but people get offended by that because of that god complex theory so i don't know police you're at a party somebody comes over so, hey, what do you do for a living? Uh, well, you know what? what? The perception of police is, is more cyclical, right? Nobody ever likes a clinician. But <laughs> but, but the, the perception of police, it, it ebbs and flows, right? In 2000, on sep we talked about September 12, 2001. Yeah. All first responders everywhere were our nation's heroes. We were the, the princes and princesses of this country for, for the better part of the next decade, mm -hmm. right? And then perceptions change. People, you know... We've had some high-profile incidents where cops acted badly, right? Um, and we're we're deservedly punished for their acts, but then tainted the rest of the profession. And it right. just right. it seems to be coming. In, and we talked about the cameras earlier. The 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 stories about cops acting badly seem to be coming in more rapid succession. Right. But the good news is there's still punishment for that. Like none of us none of us want to keep the bad actors in the fold so to speak we don't want them around us right um so even even with those things we're doing our best to weed out right the rest but back to the topic the, the god complex comes from that on our, on our side it comes from two things i think it it comes from what you commonly hear police and firefighters say is we don't get paid to fail right we right. have a job to do we're gonna we put out the fire we save the victims we we, we perform successful CPR, we investigate the crime, we solve the murder. What, we're not paid to fail. So it, right, comes, right. it comes from that need for success. And it comes from that, you, I think you mentioned in one of our earlier shows that the, 
the, the first responders didn't pick the profession, right? The profession uh, picked them, and they kind of wandered into it at some point in their life. They put the uniform right? on. So there's the, the, the people that are drawn to this profession or drawn to this profession to be helpers. It, even if they don't put, you know, in their interview, why did you want to be a cop? Even if they're not saying the old cliche, I just want to help people. I just right. want to... I want to protect and serve. Even if they don't say that, the, that that personality trait is there. Right. I'm I'm here because I want to I want to prevent people from being harmed. I want to prevent people from being victims. And when they are victims, I want to solve their crime and I want to punish the people responsible for making them victims. So and I don't get paid to lose. We don't get paid to lose in a gunfight. We don't get right. paid to lose in a physical fight. We don't get paid to lose a car chase or a foot chase. There's always that I'm going to win. Right. Uh, and I think that lends itself to now Now we've developed after years on the job, you develop this air of invincibility, right? You've been lucky, honestly, <laughs> you've been lucky so many times that you start to feel like you're invulnerable, like right. you're invincible. And that, that leads to people having that perception that first responders have a God right. complex. Um, and that air of invincibility, that perception of invincibility is obviously always... Uh, a fallacy. We're not invincible. We no, can no. be harmed. We talked to Tyler last week. Yeah. yeah, yeah you know, yeah. thank whatever God you believe in that Tyler and, and his two partners survived that night. Um, but we're clearly not invincible. Right. We were damaged that night. And and first responders are, are injured or killed on the job daily, everywhere. So the feeling of invincibility while we have it, it lends itself to that God complex. It's really... Um, it's really a misperception. There's, we're not invincible. We just want to think that we are. Oh yeah, and then we also, you know, when when you look at when you look at the differences, you know, in in our thing, if we look at our success rating based on based on that success rating, is that you have people that feed into the God complex with the therapist, right? Oh my God, you you saved my life. You helped me. You talked me off that ledge. You did this. You did that. And that God complex really becomes a very personal response that you start feeling that you could save everybody, you could fix everybody, right? right. And and I look at my profession in, in, in the trauma game is that, you know, if we look over a career, you know, it's, somebody asked me once, and it, it was stupid, it, it, it was during the, uh, the response uh, to the tsunami in Indonesia, somebody had joked around and had said, you know, how many dead bodies did you actually see? And I looked at them and I said, well, I stopped counting at 60,000. And they stopped cold. And just looked at me and said, are, are you serious? And I said, yeah. I, I said, what, what do you think a disaster site holds? I, You know, you didn't go over there and there was unicorns and little elves dancing around. And, you know, all these little monks were just walking around, you know, in their in their little sheets and all that stuff. There were dead bodies everywhere. And then if we look at, if we look at Katrina and we look at the World Trade and we look at all of these events, that these huge events happen and you walk in and you start seeing immediate reactions to people that you're interacting with, and you see that immediacy of how you can help somebody, if you allow it, that twists your brain a little bit. That twists you to the point where now you think you are the saving grace in any situation. You think you are above everybody. Now we break it down to that, that singular therapist in the private practice. Now they're having patients and they're having good results with patients. Now patients start feeding that God complex of, you're doing great, oh my God, you're the best. Oh, you, you saved me, I don't have panic attacks anymore. And then you start feeding that. Now, my thought is you humble up a little bit and understand that your, your, your talents or your position is able to help somebody you know, and that's that's what your training's about. That's what you're seeing people about, and you need to humble up. But I've seen the opposite. I've seen that God complex go incredibly bad, where people now start coming in that they're almost untouchable. You know, it's not necessarily, you know, invincible is one thing, I, and untouchable is the other, that they are so beyond reproach that that's where they start making mistakes. That they are so beyond reproach that now they start violating ethical issues they start violating their moral codes and so forth even morals and ethics aside you start violating basic basic principles of self-preservation and safety right there i i don't know it off the top of my head but there's a there's a list out there's a poster out like the the 10 the 10 rules of self-preservation and policing right, right. and one of the things it warns against is what they call tombstone courage 
<laughs> like throw caution to the wind. Right. Screw it. I'm going in, you know, head first and full speed. I'm going to go into this situation. You know where I went when you said tombstone. Kirk. <laughs> you, you can be my huckleberry. <laughs> so, yeah. But so it's the same the, thing. One of the things it warns about is that tombstone courage, right? Which is this, this overconfidence and this air of invulnerability. Yeah. That, that it warns you not to develop that. It's that, you know, that, that poster isn't for the two or three year right, right. cop. That poster is for the 15 year cop who, like I said, just thankfully has been lucky right, for right, 15 years right. and hasn't been hurt. That next hurt is always right around the corner. That next right. hurt is at the end of every radio call if you get unlucky that time. Right. So it, it warns you it's against. A, it's a gamble. It's an absolute gamble on a on a shift by shift basis. Right. Not even on a daily basis. No, it's a, a shift by shift basis. On a complaint by complaint basis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Every every next complaint you go to could be the complaint. Well, you heard Tyler telling his story last week. He said it was, it was it was routine. He had been to that type of incident, in his in his career so far, hundreds of times. Right. Um, and every one of them, you know, for for two hundred ninety nine of them, he got lucky that it didn't go bad. And, and then, number 300 went terribly wrong. Right, right. Um, and so that we have to combat this thing. Uh, we have to, like you were saying, like the, the, the therapist, the counselor needs to humble up sometimes and realize that maybe what I'm doing is helping people help themselves. Right. And I'm not right. the savior. They are their own savior. And I think right. maybe cops need to try to abandon what amounts to the God complex, the invulnerability feelings, and, and say, I've been incredibly lucky and I need to do better taking care of my own safety, my partner's safety. Like yeah. safety needs to be a conscious decision and and a, a constant effort, something you're, you're steadily working on rather than relying on your luck or your false invincibility. Well, and I'll, and I'll bring up a, a very specific situation. And that it was funny because it, you had called me right after it happened. I asked if I was, if I was good right after the situation. And, and it's based on that same principle is that, okay, how many patients does the average therapist, psychiatrist, psychologist see? And who do you piss off? So we had uh, several years ago, not several, it, you know, it's been about seven, I would say. Uh, we had one of our psychiatrists here in the state of Delaware murdered. She had, she, it was uh, Caroline E. Kong, and God, she was a friend, God bless her. Um, she had seen a patient, she worked over at the Rockford Center, which is a psychiatric hospital. She saw a patient five years prior to this incident, five years prior. There was one encounter with this patient, and she happened to sign an involuntary commitment order to this patient. The patient ended up going through school, going through college, graduated from the University of Delaware, and then one night decided to wait in Caroline's uh, vestibule in her house, wait in, the, uh, wait in the front area of the house when she got home and stabbed her to death. Five years after this one encounter. I, that's what we're dealing with in our society right now, is that if we don't humble up, then we forget that that one person we met five years ago could have our name. And, and come after us in any way, shape, or form. And if that doesn't rock you in any way, and, and it's funny, in my house, you know, no, I, I normally lock the front door. That's not an issue, you know, whatever it is. But we have a screen door. The screen door is the original door of this house that's 260 years old. There's a little latch on that door that if, if my daughter's cat decided to run through, would break this damn lock, this little little latch from your daughter's cat weighs twenty six pounds. Yeah, he's a he's a big cat. <laughs> but in that in that in that moment when that happened, I went home and started questioning every single person I saw in a career that you know has spanned the two and a half decades. You got to make a who could kill me list. I mean, and, and that was almost you know what was that Billy Madison right? You know, so I walked home that night, which I had never ever done, and I latched that little latch. I put that latch on that screen door thinking somehow that would save me. It, it was the, 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 the humbling situation that said we're vulnerable, that, that if you try this bizarre God complex, if you believe that you are better than anybody or that you could save everybody or that you could fix everything, is that guess what? You can't. You could do your best. You could help people. You could be there as an officer. You can go on that call and you could help somebody. But there's somebody with your name. There's somebody out there that ultimately wants to do you harm or wants to bring you down as, as much as possible. You know, 
Yeah. And then we get into, you know, general police work. I talked about the tombstone courage and the, this invulnerability. Then you get the guys that specialize, right? You get the you get the specialist cops. Typically your tactical team members right. and your hostage negotiators. I had a hostage negotiation instructor walk into a room during my initial training class and said, you are all, you must be the cockiest, most narcissistic <laughs> assholes I've ever met in my life. If you think you alone have the power to talk someone out of something right. that they really want to do. So, so yeah, I mean, the people that applied for the hostage team, we, <laughs> we really believe that just like a clinician, like we're the savior, right? We're going to walk in. Somebody's hell bent on doing right. something, either taking a life, taking their own life, escaping from, from capture, what have you. Their, their right. whole game is they're going to escape from these consequences. They're going to carry out this act. And the negotiators come in and have to have, I mean, almost necessarily have kind of a God complex right. to think that we can walk in and change someone's mind and change someone's future with just our voice. Right, right. Um, well, and I think you also have to understand it comes down to two things. Don't, you know, one, you know, make sure you're kind to everybody. And two, don't be a dick. I think I, if you want to combat the, the, the God complex to it, that's the first thing you need to understand. Don't be a dick to people. You know, when you're when you're in that chance encounter and you encounter anybody, be kind. You know, do your job. Do your job as a therapist. Do your job as a cop. But don't be a dick to that person. And I think that, you know, once you start that route, then that's where you start building this complex. And, and I think an illustration of that is, and we've seen this happen a number of times recently, um, when, when, there's, when there's one of these officers that I talked about earlier that's assigned to a neighborhood right. for a long term, for years is specifically there to get to know people, places, and things in that neighborhood. Right. And, and he's been kind, right. and he's been approachable, and he's treated people with respect. And then a violent encounter happens. A lot of times you'll see the people from the neighborhood come and assist the officer. Yeah, yeah. And, and so the, in those cases, when you have that much, when you have a community as your backup, then you don't need to be invincible. You don't right. need to be God. You just need to be, like you said, just be kind. Just be you. Be fair. Don't be a dick. Right. Don't be a dick. So <laughs> there's our God complex topic. Don't be a dick. So, hey, thanks for listening to the, the Cop and a Shrink. We have our current events coming up. Uh, again, go to us at uh, copandashrink.com. Check us out on where you would listen to podcasts. Uh, and also uh, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. We've been uh, posting. We will continue to post. And once a new episode drops, we'll put it there. So, again, thanks for listening to the Cop and the Shrink. You have seen their faces and read their stories. Our hospital heroes and first responders are remarkable. Their strength is inspiring as they continue to work around the clock in the fight against COVID-19. Throughout the pandemic, they have had limited downtime and limited access to prepared meals. Our hospital heroes are working in extremely stressful environments, literally placing their own safety at risk to help the sick and dying. Our mission is to show these frontline workers that we, the community they are caring for, supports and cares for them through the simple act of providing them with a prepared meal to help sustain them through the day. To complete this mission, we are partnering with local restaurants to deliver quality food directly to hospitals, urgent cares, testing centers, treatment centers, nursing facilities, and first responder stations. We have delivered nearly 25,000 meals to over 60 locations in Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland. We have been honored to help these amazing men and women. The meals we bring are met with such gratitude. In those moments, as the meals are set up, we see their gratitude in the form of tears and laughter. A simple meal can provide hope in the face of this terrifying disease. The Trauma Survivors Foundation's Hospital Heroes Food Drive has the incredible privilege of coming into the worlds of our hospital heroes and first responders at the most difficult time in their lives. For a $6 meal donation, you can help a hospital hero and a struggling restaurant stay focused and positive through the COVID-19 pandemic. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, but we still need your help to see our hospital heroes through this fight. Our heroes are why we do what we do, but you are the how. Your donation helps us provide food and hope to our frontline heroes your donation makes hope stronger than fear text hospital heroes to 44321 to donate a meal to a hero 
please visit us at hospitalheroesfooddrive.org to learn more about our mission. Hey gang, welcome back to The Cop and the Shrink. Remember to visit us at thecompoftheshrink.com. Uh, two great topics today. So we're, far. So far. <laughs> so, so current events wise, and, and you and I were talking about this one, which I thought was, it's apropos and, and we wanted to go into a different direction, or at least I convinced you to go into a different direction with it. For those from Philadelphia, or at least from the Philadelphia area, I, I think worldwide know about these places. Philadelphia is known for their cheesesteaks, you know, is that, you know, you get your little chopped ribeye meat on a long roll. Uh, you get it with uh, whiz, which is cheese whiz, or whiz without, you know, you, whiz is, what is it? You get a whiz wit, which is uh, cheese whiz and onions. And whiz whiz without. without is just, you know, cheese, cheese whiz, whiz. And on, on the bun. And, and, you know, people love it. They go all the time. So the two most popular, they're not my favorite. I'm, I'm going to tell you that right now. It's Sorry. A, it's a tourist trap. It, it's, it is what it is. I, I am, I have a couple of favorite places that I love, but, you know, Pat's and Geno's, the Pat's King of Steaks and Geno Steaks, uh, out off of Pass Young in, in South Philadelphia, have been iconic, have been iconic since I think the 30s. You know, and, and it's funny because they have the cheesesteak wars that go on where their signs get bigger, and then all of a sudden the neon starts coming out and the pictures of the celebrities and so forth. These are iconic. When people are, are going to visit in Philadelphia, you ask them where they want to go, they want to see the Liberty Bell, and they want to get a cheesesteak from Pat's and Gino's. Anybody outside of the area, they want to get a cheesesteak. And, and these are the iconic places. You go to a game, a concert, it's not unusual to drive over to Pat's and Gino's at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, stand in line, you know, in, in a drunken haze, waiting for, for a cheesesteak. And every now and then the Eagles chant will break out. And, and it, it, it tends almost to be a party atmosphere. At, at late night. Problem is, past two months, we've had two incidences that resulted in the, the death of two people. The first incident, uh, two people didn't know each other. There was no history between the two. They were waiting in line. Words were exchanged. Uh, a fight started breaking out, and one of, the, one of the guys pulls a gun from his waistband, shoots and kills the other guy in the back. And then, it basically, it said he was standing his ground he was defending himself but you know I'm not I'm not judge and jury I don't know what was that but there was there was one murder the second one just happened a week ago and it was after a union soccer game a group of people were coming uh, coming up from actually the Chester area which they had to drive into South Philadelphia to go to Pat Stakes they're in line I guess they started arguing about the game or whatever it is and five men ended up beating another man to death at Pat Stakes. Literally beating him to death. Used a used a uh, uh, the top of a trash can to start beating him, injured the man's uh, father. I guess it was a brother or a friend that was also injured here. But my my point is is not necessarily Pat Stakes. I don't think Pat Stakes is encouraging murders in there because obviously they're iconic. They don't want that. It's bad for business. Right. But this goes into that lawlessness again, that we're seeing places that we would go that, you know, that I know you and I have, have visited that we would go now. Do we start questioning these things? Do we start questioning in our society right now? Do we go to these iconic places because these things can happen? Well, yeah, because I'm invulnerable. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> the God complex, right? You know, I can go anywhere I want because, damn it, that's where I'm going to go. But let, let's put it this way. We both have kids. You know, we know that this happens. What's the likelihood that we don't go? I mean, let's be honest. We would go a lot of places where we wouldn't take our kids. But well, true, but, I, but I get, that's us. I get your point. Like in, in Philadelphia, these these two places, they're across the street from one another. For those of you who don't know, they, they sit on a corner diagonal from one another, right. and they're, they're serving the same food. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever says that one is better than the other just hasn't tried both. I mean, I've heard it was the fries were better at pets. So that's it. No. <laughs> but the, these places are, are ostensibly a, a tourist attraction more than – more than a good cheesesteak. You want a good cheesesteak, you go over to Oregon Avenue, right? You don't... But it's a tourist attraction. People come to see these two places. They come to say, I went to Pat's and Gino's. Maybe maybe some people come and get one from each. They can do a, a taste <laughs> test. I don't know. But then like Dennis said, it, it's, store right afterwards. it's <laughs> iconic. So people come there. People tend to gravitate to it. And especially because they're open at 
2 a.m. after you, right. you, you leave the club, you leave the football game, you know, you leave a house party, whatever. You go here, and it's it's good. It's not. It's good 2 a.m. food, and right. it's a place that everybody knows. It's a place that people from out of town want to see. So, I don't think that I don't think the place has anything to do with the crime. I think it's that the people who committed these crimes were drawn to gather there because it was right. the place to go. Right. Um, but we we did. You know, a couple of things that would be relevant, we talked about earlier today and we talked about earlier in the series, uh, people have forgotten how to people, right? right. There's, there's, there's a certain amount these days of disregard for or contempt for the law, um, for law enforcement. And then there's, there's also the effect of we've lived our lives for the past 17 months from behind a screen, yep. right? We've yep. lived our lives interacting with people digitally. If you, if you can't be if you can't be punched in the mouth, then you're not taking any precautions against being punched in the mouth. Yep. And I think that you've gotten accustomed to talking to people on Zoom, on the telephone, on you know, on FaceTime and video calls. Through God help us, through social media, you'll right, say things right. on social media that you wouldn't say in, in a civilized society anywhere, but right. you'll, you'll right. express it on social media. And then you get out in a crowd of people, especially in a crowd of soccer hooligans from the union game, <laughs> and you start comporting yourself like you do on social media. You say the things that you say on social media. You say the things that you would say to people on the phone. And you forget that that barrier to being punched in the mouth is no longer there. Your mouth is out there for the world right, to punch. Right. Uh, and and that, that is probably what's leading to a little bit of the breakdown in civilized behavior in so many of these places right. is that people have forgotten how to people in person. Right. And that, you know, and again, I think it's, and we talked about that, about being behind a screen for so long or being locked up, you know, for, for the duration of, of an 18-month period. And people are now just kind of figuring out that we're going out, we've had this bad behavior, and we could continue it in society without repercussions, when in fact, there's going to be a ton of repercussions. Then again, I don't know, there's an investigation still going on with, with this latest with the soccer hooligans, I don't know what was said. I don't. I, I. I. I just, for me personally, I can't see an argument over a sports team resulting in somebody's death. I, right. I can't see that argument. I mean, you know, you go to you go to an Eagles game, and, and you know, there's going to be fisticuffs. People are going to get a holler. You know, you, you drink enough, and okay, Cowboys are coming in next uh, next Monday, and, and yeah, people are going to talk shit. I mean, that's the way it is, and I think. There's, there's a nuance to that. You, you could say all that you want, and you could rib each other back and forth, and you could, you know, your team sucks with this, and, you know, oh, you know, how about, oh, you got one championship, we got five, well, that wasn't since the 90s, and you know, all this crap that could be said. But when it comes down to it is that it, it, it's part of the game, that ribbing is part of the, part of the game, right. but not murder. You don't murder somebody because you don't like – my football team, or you don't like my stance on something. There's nothing that could be said in line at a cheesesteak joint that, that justifies even assaulting someone, let alone killing someone. Right. I just, I, it, well, the initial reports was is that, well, alcohol played a factor. Well, of course alcohol played a factor. If it didn't, I'd be really, really surprised. <laughs> but alcohol played a factor. But even if it plays a factor, it doesn't excuse the behavior. You know, you, you can't say, well, because he was drunk, well, you know, okay, I could see murdering somebody because I was drunk. I, you right. can't do that. And if, if you drove from Chester, which if, if you don't know, it's a good 20 minutes from, from the stadium into South Philadelphia. If you drove all that way, speaking about broken windows, you, you committed a crime. You were, you were DUI you right. know, driving that way. You drove there, you waited in line, you're waiting for your food. Then all of a sudden somebody said, your soccer team sucks. And then the other person says, no, yours sucks. How the hell does it go from there to I'm going to stomp you to death. And then, and then again, we go back to a non-sports-related situation where somebody started shoving and pushing or whatever it is two months prior, and you pull a gun on the person and shoot them and kill them. It, it boggles my mind in our society right now is that we have come down to this fact that there is no stopping people once they get started in this, I guess, disrespect or whatever it is. And it, I could be wrong. People have become so accustomed to the ability on social media to express whatever they want, whatever hateful, 
stupid sideways ideas that come into their head. They, like, they've become comfortable with expressing that and they don't, I think people are starting to forget. I think that, is it evolve? No, it would be devolve. Society's starting to devolve to the point where yeah. where people are losing perspective on what can and should be said right. in in a civilization. And and so they say, like I said, whatever stupid, hateful, sideways ideas come into their heads, right. they're comfortable expressing that online. And they're they're comfortable judging people and grouping people. You're you're black, you're white, you're Latino, you're vaxxed, you're unvaxxed, you're a masker, you're a Republican, you're a Trumpster, you're a Democrat. Like we become comfortable grouping people, and if you're not in my group, then I hate your group. Right. And and that doesn't. I'm not, I don't even want to say it's fine on social media, but it's accepted right. by the people on social media. But it doesn't work in reality. It doesn't work out here no. in the in the face to face world. It, it, and it's funny that people. However, and I mean, however, go ahead, qualify go ahead. with that. If you come out here and say something that's stupid or hateful right. or sideways. That still doesn't justify somebody from Group B murdering you for it. And, and, and I was going to not just say that, but I was going to say, look, if somebody comes into my face and <laughs> starts screaming at me because I have an opinion or whatever it is, that person does run the, the risk of getting punched. Let's be honest about it. I, I, okay, you shouldn't, you shouldn't strike anybody or anything like that. But again, then again, if you're in somebody's face, they have every right to defend themselves. They've, they've taken that step to, yeah. to be threatening towards you. They're yeah. in your space. They're exhibiting threatening behavior. Obviously, you have a right to defend yourself. But, but murder. The, but these attacks. Yeah, like, this is this is different. When you got six six people aren't defending themselves against one. Six people are attacking one. Yeah, yeah. Or if you if you're getting getting your ass whooped instead of running away, which I'm sorry, you don't know the guy. It's not. I don't care how disrespected you feel that you are. You don't pull a gun and shoot the guy. It. You know what's the easiest thing you do? You get the hell away from him. I, I'm I'm sorry. It maybe that's not quote unquote the manly thing to do. But I'm sorry, I do not want to waste my life, my, 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 my family's life, my practice life, because you didn't like the way I ordered a cheesesteak. You know, look, I'm sorry, I'm not the guy that likes whiz. I'm sorry, you know, I'll, I'll get American or I'll get provolone. I, I like a little sharp provolone, a little broccoli rob. You really want to piss them off? Go up there and order a chicken sandwich. <laughs> but, I, you know, if, if, a, if a fight happens and somebody's getting the better of me, Look, my point is, is that, that I don't want to be killed. I want to run away. It's self-protection, you know, that, that fight or flight response. Now, you know, I will try my best to my, defend myself, but if the person is just throwing fists at me, my response, or at least in my head, is that I throw fists back. I don't reach for a weapon. Right. That's my response. But now we have a response right now that I'm going to reach for a weapon, shoot and kill you. Now I've ruined your life and I've ruined my life and everybody in both of our lives have been ruined. Because I made a decision just because you were getting the upper hand at that point. And that's that first murder. Here is another one is that literally you don't like my soccer team. So we start busting balls about a soccer team. And then all of a sudden we start curb stomping you because of soccer. They, like literally my epitaph. I don't want to say died because he really liked the union soccer. soccer. That... That in and of itself would drive me insane. There's a lot of things that I want in my epitaph. You know, that's not one of them. You know, killed because of soccer fandom. Fan, you know, the the hooligan nature of it all. So, is there? And maybe this is a question that we both should answer. It is there a way to avoid this? Is there a way to stop this type of behavior in our society right now? Or have we just gone off the rails because social media has created? this invincibility <laughs> thank you for asking um you know part of part of what is contributing to this problem is the fact that lawlessness has been encouraged to an extent I, I don't know what they've done to the laws in pennsylvania but i know here in delaware it feels like and the public has a perception that the state not necessarily on the law enforcement level but on the judicial side or the judiciary um, have gone soft on crime, right? We've right. got what this bail reform. People are people are being caught for their second or third time with firearms, illegally carried firearms. They're already convicted felons, um, and they're being released on unsecured bail. 
or they're committing assaults and they're being released on unsecured bail or, or you know, own recognizance. I read the other day somebody who committed a felony assault was released on his own recognizance. <laughs> and so you're almost making it okay in some people's minds to go out and commit these crimes if well if there's no consequence right, right. if i'm gonna if i'm gonna get level two probation if i'm gonna not have to pay bail to get out even though i've been caught with a gun and a pocket full of heroin or fentanyl there's no consequence right, right. so they're gonna go out and they're gonna however they obtained that first gun in illegally or they don't obtain the third gun illegally and they're gonna go out and they're gonna commit these crimes again so uh, i think th the message has been sent unfortunately that a lot of places have gone soft on crime and criminals. Right. And I think that the only way to start reversing that is to get back to aggressively and, and appropriately, in my opinion, enforcing these laws. If right. you assault someone, you go to jail. If you carry a firearm and you're already a person prohibited, you go to jail. It used to be, used to be um, five years of mandatory federal time for carrying a gun as a convicted felon. Now, most jurisdictions have done away with minimum mandatory sentencing. Wow. Most jurisdictions have done away with cash or secured bail. Not most, many right, jurisdictions right. have done away with cash or secured bail, and so it's a revolving door. You know, this. Right. You know, today Billy commits a gun crime and gets arrested. We took that gun and we took those drugs and we put Billy back out on the road. By right. noon the next day, Billy's got another gun. Right. Right. And this time he's going to be pissed off at whoever called him in the first time. Maybe he's going to go shoot it's them. It's just maybe, this revolving door. Or, or maybe policy, he's going to get yeah. in a stupid argument with somebody at Geno's and shoot them in the back. But he <laughs> shouldn't have that worse. gun. Because we arrested him with one right. yesterday, and and maybe he should still be locked up awaiting trial for that. Right. I, I there was a uh, there was a video that was out or a story that was out. Uh, college town, father and son had or father and daughter had gone to we'll say Target had gone to whatever whatever store. Daughter was waiting in line. Daughter's eighteen nineteen years old. A guy older guy in his sixties was doing an upskirt shot with a cell phone to the girl that was waiting in line. The girl saw him. When what what are you doing, you pervert? You know, blah blah blah. Kind of confronted the guy. The guy then comes back with this barrage of like nastiness. You know, the the c word and all this at the at that. The father sees this, walks over and clocks the guy. Perfect. Yeah, which to me, as as a father of of two daughters now, I I have no problem with that. I if 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 he was doing an upskirt of my son, our producer. That might have been. Then he might like it. I don't know. Just kidding. Just kidding. Love him to death. Um, the father that clocks this guy gets arrested. I, and I think, I mean, a, as a father of two daughters myself, I think that's a perfectly appropriate re reaction to what this man right. did. I think you stomp on his phone, you destroy the phone. Yeah, and destroy the you, evidence. And at then least, you throw you know? him head first out the door, using his head to open the door, oh, the said door and throw him out through the door, get him out of that store. I mean, I had an encounter. I had an encounter with my daughter in a retail establishment right, that right. I told you about two weeks ago. Right. Um, I gave the, I gave the man a verbal warning right. and he left the store. <laughs> um, so I didn't have to stomp on him, but I, I'm afraid that if I had caught him taking upskirts of her, I, I, I may have reacted the same way this person did. I, I would lose my mind. Now, the good, the 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 good about the end of the story was the father was was let go. They they found the circumstances, saw the pictures, and then this pervert ended up getting arrested himself, and you know was facing I, I, I believe jail time with it. But to be to defend your child in this way he didn't shoot and kill the guy he defended his child now child's 18 years old i don't give a shit you know my i'll be i'll be 98 years old and and my my youngest daughter will be 40 but i mean you know whatever it is i'm still going to do everything i can to defend but it doesn't come to murder my my child is 23 and taller than i am yeah and i will still defend her if the need arises, there's no, it doesn't matter that she was 18 or that she was 11. Right. right. I, I think that, I think that in that case, showing this, this man, the error of his ways might've been the appropriate thing to do. Right. Now, I, I don't advocate, you know what I mean? Like I don't advocate wanton violence or, but there comes a point where the whole mother bear instinct yeah. kicks yeah. in. Right. Um, and, and like you said, the, the investigation was done and it was deemed to be justified. And, and you know, that's, it's what it is. There, there's, there's people like that in the world. I think we could do some justification with defense, right? But murder, we can't justify. We can't justify that. Yeah. Do I? Would I? Would I want to murder the guy? Would I tell myself I would murder the guy? 
you know, and if we were on Mare of Easttown, we murdered a dirter. You, 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 <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you could imagine it. You could say, you know, what would happen if you kick the idea around in your head, but you don't, ultimately you don't murder a guy. You don't murder him over you, a you soccer clock loss, him. right? You, you use his head to open up the doors. When, when uh, I, I grew up in a I grew up in a working class neighborhood where the Red Clay Creek separated our community from another community. Right. And we used to go down to the creek, meet in the middle, and have fights. Right. We would throw rocks at each other. We would fist fight. People would get injured and bloodied up, and then. Um, we were all in the local little league, and then the next day we would go and we would play baseball <laughs> games against each other, right? And nobody got hit with bats. And right, no right. fights broke out at the baseball games. No. We were angry today. We're playing baseball tomorrow. Right. Um, well, it's, remember, but it, but it, we're in a different world now. Like I said, I think this. I think this softness on crime has contributed to this increase in crime, and it's all, all the places that are saying, "Oh, we have a huge uptick in right. crime. We have a problem with violence. How do we fix it?" These are the same places that have said. No cash bail, no secure bail, revolving door, prosecutions are down, sentencing is down. So the, the politicians are crying about both sides of the argument, right. and, and they're, it's a self-created problem. Right, right. And it's, it's a problem that, that needs to be addressed, and, and we could definitely address it at a different time <laughs> because we're out of time. <laughs> so, well, thanks. This was a good one. I said it would be a good one. Good we had to bring it home from, from last night. Last time was spectacular. This time, I think, was just splendiferous. It's a well, good word. We can't be spectacular every week. No, nah, no. Nah, we could try, though. We don't give the viewers anything to look forward to. No, we gotta we got to keep them on the edge. So anyway, this is, uh, this is Dennis and Harold from The Cop and the Shrink. Make sure you visit us at thecopandtheshrink.com. Uh, also, check us out on, uh, on the Trauma Survivors Foundation.org. Uh, buy our wares. We got merch uh, on, on thecopandtheshrink.com. Check us out on Instagram. Do us a favor. Press like and uh, get us more followers. We, we, we are up. We are doing well. Our initial goal was seven. I we've, think we've doubled that. We've now. doubled that. We're we're doing fantastic, and we want le- uh, we want viewership everywhere, and we want listenership everywhere. So make sure that if you do like us, uh, share us and tell people that uh, how how pretty awesome we are. So <laughs> not our god complex at all. <laughs> so thanks a lot, folks. We will check you out next time on the Cop and the Shrink.